We're here at CSIS. Uh, I'm really happy to have Sean Karen Cross, who's the CEO and president of the Millennium Challenge Corporation. Um, after a long wait, we have a fully installed uh, MCC president. I think that's something uh, that's worthy of applause. Why don't we give our friend Sean a round of applause and welcome him. So Sean, congratulations. I think you get the prize for sort of um, saintly patience and, and diplomacy. And, uh, I think I'm um, really, really glad that you're in this job. I think it's uh, really important that government agencies have uh, Senate confirmed leaders, and so I think it's really important that, that, that you've had this that um, you've been entrusted with this role. So I wanted to um, give you a chance to uh, share some of your views with, uh, with our friends here uh, about how you see the future of the MCC and but before we do that, maybe you ought to just give this group, I think everyone probably in this audience, if they're here in mid-August, is probably knows all about the MCC. But maybe just so that we're all on the same page, if you might just do sort of the MCC 101 from your perspective. What is the MCC? Sure. And, um, uh, and how does it work? And then I've got a couple of softball questions for you. We can take Great. it from there. I, I'm pro softball question. <laughs> um, well, before that, thank you, Dan, and thank you to CSIS uh, for hosting the event. We appreciate it. Well, to our agency uh, to be able to get out and talk about it. Um, and I also just want to say it's it's an honor to be nominated to do a job like this, and I couldn't be prouder to represent uh, an agency with such a tremendous staff. So. Um, I, I've only been in a couple of weeks. I can tell you already, it's the, it's the best job I've, I've ever had, and I'm looking forward uh, to, to moving, moving forward. And I also say thank you. I see faces around the room, Tim Docking, I think Mima's in the crowd, and, and people who have been very supportive and helpful to me during this uh, whole process. So thank you all. Um, Okay, MCC. Well, MCC is a, we're an independent U.S. development agency and we do development by design uh, differently. So we work on a trees on, um, on, a, on a scorecard basis. So we look to consolidate gains in good governance, economic reform, and investment in a government's people. And once our eligibility criteria are met, we work with those governments um, if our board determines that we should proceed to, uh, rec you know, to identify constraints on their economic growth. And this is a process that we undertake in conjunction with the host country, our partner countries, and it's country-led. So the idea is they come to us and they say this is what we need and we want a partnership with you. And then we go through a rigorous open process to determine what the root causes uh, of economic constraints are and identify sustainable, measurable, achievable product, uh, projects that will address those constraints and have the highest impact on the lives of our partner countries' um, people. And during, the, during that process, we demand accountability from our partner countries. So we have conditions precedent that we meet, um, that we demand are met over the course of these projects. And if they are not, we have the ability to withdraw funds or to um, narrow the scope of a project or even to cancel a project. And so we regard, I think the agency has an excellent track record of being great stewards of the American taxpayer dollars because after all, these are grants that we're engaged in. This isn't a loan that we're giving. This isn't something that saddles a country with debt. This is a project and a partnership that we enter into and say this is, this is our grant working with you to achieve a concrete result. It's going to be accountable, it's going to be measured, and then it's going to be analyzed um, for years and years afterwards. And by the way, this is all available um, online. It's very transparent, every contract we're in all the uh, rates of return on our projects. And our staff has recently come up with evaluation briefs, which we're very proud of, yeah. which makes it even more accessible uh, for, the, for the American public to get a grip on what we're doing and put eyes on it. So the way I, I, I don't mean to be too glib about this, but I, 
Yeah, I've always thought that the MCC was sort of like the publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes of global development, and that Ed McMahon knocked on the door and said, remember those TV ads yeah, with the check? And so I'm, I'm dating myself, but, but no, you, okay. you, you sort of Ed McMahon would come and say, you've met a series of, we, we have done serious, rigorous analysis using open source data across several buckets of, of data. I think, there's, I think there's a variety of, I don't know if it's 16 indicators or 17 20. indicators or 20, 20, 20 indicators within these buckets. And you've met the, you've met the requirements and so now we've got, we've got a significant amount of money that we're prepared to provide to you if you are willing to work with us. And then, it, then there's a conversation and a negotiation about what Correct. that looks like. Um, I think what also I think is really great about what you guys, so I think the, the transparency, the, um, the flexibility you all have, I think the analysis that you do both in terms of leveraging sort of open source analysis, you're using global different data sources, the World Bank or the Index of Economic Freedom or other, other sources. And then I think the constraints to growth analysis I think has been a very important innovation for, for global development as well. You, you talk about the, the, there's an M MCC model. Can you talk a little bit, I mean, you talked a little bit about it. Uh, there's also the MCC effect Yes. Can you talk a little bit about the MCC effect? Because I, I think that is really a really interesting Sure. Phenomenon. Well, I think the model and the effect are they're related. Are, they're they're yep. related. Yep. And so the, the model is what has made MCC such a success. We're in our 15th year of existence. This came um, out of the Bush administration and in, was started in 2004. And what has kept our track record so good and what leads to what we'll talk about in the, the MCC effect is this objective view of who's eligible and then this data-driven approach to developing these projects. And so the eligibility side of it, how we select partner countries to work with, it's based on these independent yep. scorecards that are drawn from you know, Heritage Foundation, Freedom the Works, World Bank. World Bank, objective criteria that break down into good governance indicators, economic uh, freedom indicators, and a government's investment in their people indicators. And if they, if they pass those scorecards relative to the rest of the countries in the world, which are, we can work with either low-income countries or lower-middle-income countries. So that's the need-based component. The yep. merit-based component is the scorecard uh, level. Then, then we engage in a conversation with our board of directors, uh, which is made up of state, USTR, AID, um, and four private sector, um, and treasury and four private yep. sector board members, uh, to engage with them. That's a, that's a process that we're not making a policy decision based on some other strategic concern. Or, or, or I woke up in the morning and said, I really like Malawi right. today. Right. This is, it's, it's designed to keep the process objective. It's designed to help the agency stay laser focused on its singular mission of reducing poverty through economic growth. And I think it's led to an enormous amount of bipartisan support on the Hill. I think it has great cachet in the countries where we yes. work and the respect for the development model is very strong. And so just as, as CEO coming in, that model is very important to me. And I'm sure we'll talk about yeah. concurrent compacts and regional yes. authority coming up, but to preserve and protect that model and grow the support for that model is a big goal of mine. So then we get to the MCC effect and that really is aligning incentives, right? Humans are incentive-based creatures. Yeah. And so countries want us to engage with them. This is a grant for a major infrastructure project typically. Leads to, um, it opens the door to a lot of private sector capital coming in because it's, it's creating an enabling environment that's very positive. It's the US government stamp of approval that this is a government that's doing good things. Um, and on the front end of that, countries try to um, put themselves in a good position to work with us. So a great example of this is Cote d'Ivoire. President Ouattara was elected in 2010 following a civil war. Their uh, country met four of 20 indicators at the time. And within five years, 
they met 14, uh, they exceeded 14 of 20 indicators, and, and we engaged in a compact with them. And that's because the president came in and said, I'm establishing a unit within my new administration specifically to meet MCC's criteria. We want to work with the Americans. Um, we want them here, and we want that the cachet, you want you know, the cachet. The cachet that comes with that. Yep. And so we were just, I was just in Cote d'Ivoire last week for the uh, AGOA conference, but also because our compact entered into force, which means the five year clock, all our projects Starts are ticking. Yeah, we're, we're five years on time, on budget, pencils down. That's the time we have by design. And that started in uh, just, just last week. And it was kind of great. I'm not, it was online, but the, uh, the president had brought in a countdown clock, which is this, it's this big digital clock, and a, and a big elephant was welded on top of it. And, uh, and they started it right there in the room, and it's counting down. And that now sits in the MCA, which is the in-country entity that manages that these projects, it. and which is another which is another very important piece of what we do. The infrastructure and project piece is the what we do. The knowledge transfer of how we do it, I regard as equally important because it's such a contrast to other development models. It's open procurement, it's, um, it's transparency, it's debt analysis and uh, an understanding of how to bid projects out correctly. And all of that creates an environment that's, that's very positive um, very positive for these countries. And just one other example of that, we had just uh, a week or so ago, we had the human resource managers from the in-country MCAs, which are staffed by country uh, individuals from our partner countries, all into MCC for a workshop, collaborative workshop on how we run human resources management in, uh, at MCC. And so we're talking about things like uh, gender equality in the workforce. Mm. We're talking about things and you know, non-harassment. We're talking about merit-based uh, hiring decisions. And all of this knowledge transfer is being shared and it's growing within, uh, within our partner countries because of what MCC is doing. And I just think that that's a huge component of what we do and hopefully a legacy that we're leaving behind in these in our part of no, I think this word cachet, I think, is very important. I think that, like you said, I think there are incentives for countries. It's been proven. There have been a series of studies done that actually demonstrate there is an MCC effect and that countries want to be labeled as an MCC partner country. And it's, 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 it's uh, changing behaviors and changing policies. So I think it's, that's been a very important contribution to, uh, to global development. The, you've now been in business, as you said, for 15 years. There's, historically it's been, the, the model's been five years. Um, you've worked in a specific country. Um, there's been, but there's been some adjustments just recently. Talk a little bit about that. There was a, there was some, there's been some changes I think in the last, in, in, the, in the most recent past that gives you some new authorities. So talk a little bit about that. Yes, sure. And of course the, the whole design of the agency is to, is to learn uh, it's an iterative yeah. process. So every compact we enter into, every new agreement, we're constantly self-evaluating and trying to do it, trying to do it better. Uh, the new authority that Dan's talking about was last year in the uh, African Growth and Opportunity and Millennium Challenge Modernization Act. Uh, we were given the authority to work uh, on con concurrent compacts. So previously, we could only enter into a project which we call a compact with a single country. And now we have the ability to do a concurrent compact with an existing partner so long as it's promoting regional investment or regional trade. So just for ease of conversation, I refer to them as regional compacts. That's technically not exactly right, but the idea is to grow a, help grow a regional sustainable economy and, and link countries. So cross countries. Cross country, cross border. So as I was saying before, with any new authority, um, it's new ground. We're working through how to do this. In December of last year, our board selected five West African countries as eligible for a regional compact. And we're in the process of working through what those projects would look like, um, you know, uh, how, 
what exact sectors they would be in, who would participate in them uh, among those five countries. But what's important to me and what's important to the staff at MCC is that as we engage in this, the same rigor, the same accountability, the same transparency and evaluation, the same model applies to this regional um, authority. So we're looking to make sure that our first foot footfalls out of the gate here are very successful. And, so uh, so just, just as an example, let's say yeah. you had an agricultural corridor that crossed a, an ar a, a, a political border, so it was two countries in West Africa. It would make a lot of sense to have a regional compact. There's, there are good reasons to have yes. something like this, right? Yes, there are great reasons. There are, there are, uh, there are transportation corridors, there are power transmission agriculture. corridors. Agriculture. Uh, th th it makes a great deal of sense. I mean, one of the things, and some of what we're doing right now has a great deal of regional impact. So in Malawi, we did a, a power sector compact, and Malawi now has the ability to hook in to the South African power pool. They're engaged in an agreement with Mozambique right now. Th that's coming online, and that's because of the MCC compact um, from the first time around. In Cote d'Ivoire, the uh, port infrastructure and the Aquaba roundabout and I don't know if anyone here has been to Abidjan, but the traffic is, it, it's not even really traffic, it's just sort of concrete on the... <laughs> just no movement, just, there's, there's no, no movement. movement. Right, so for example, we had, <laughs> I think, two, uh, two miles between the hotel and the airport and our... It's country, better to walk. Our country team is like, well, there are times when you have to build in three hours to get to, to the airport, so... Get my steps in. Right, to get your steps in. <laughs> and so easing the congestion in that port, which is... Uh, a major component of our compact with Cote d'Ivoire is going to have a regional effect because, that, because Abidjan is a major source um, of, um, of transport and, and trade. So this, this raises something that we did a paper a couple of years ago about the MCC and one of the things we found was that about more than 50% of the, of, the, of the work that was done that MCC projects had done or uh, part of Comsec had a infrastructure component. And in some ways, again, you could argue that the MCC, and I'm very much in favor of this, that there's been a finger on the scale as part of the constraints to growth analysis when they, you kind of run the constraints of a country through sort of the Excel spreadsheet and the, the really smart people at the MCC who are helping you and supporting this and, or partnering with the governments. What comes out is sort of at the end, when the smoke clears, is we need a port or we need power, or we need roads. And that, there's a lot of, I think it's great. I think we should be doing more infrastructure. Could you have any comment on that? that, that, that does it feel, it seems as if it, it, the MCC in some ways is sort of the backdoor infrastructure agency of the US government. Well, I think, I think what I would say is those constraints analyses and the, and the final projects are determined by whatever, wherever the facts lead, that's yeah. where we wind up. And, it may be the case, and it certainly is the case, that most of our portfolio is, um, is either transportation or energy infrastructure. But in many of our partner countries, those are, that's, that's where what's the needed. analysis leads. You know, the other thing that I'd say I wanna make sure to mention is we're, MCC's unique as well because we're not only working on the hard infrastructure, but we do institutional and policy reform and uh, as sort of an anti-corruption, with a heavy focus on anti-corruption in order to create the sort of enabling environment that will lead to a sustainable economy. And so in many of these places, uh, we are engaged in, uh, in that reform as well. And we have a whole other section of projects that we can engage mm -hmm. in for countries that don't quite meet the compact criteria called threshold programs that are smaller projects, usually. Um, it's like MCC finishing school. Yeah, it's MCC, that's right. It's, 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 trying, to, it's trying to help. Uh, it's a pre-game, it's like it, it's smaller projects focused on a specific thing. It's right? a country a that's on issue. the right track. They're, they're trying to do the right thing and we're trying to help get them uh, to a good place in terms of our criteria and consolidate some gains that they're making. But to really go in and leverage some institutional reform. You'll, like you'll, you'll, you'll say, look, we have these transparent set of metrics from all over the world. It's not our metrics. And you're, you're, you've got a gap here and here. Yep. And we want to use the threshold program to cl close the gap in these two areas, That's right. right? That's right. 
So it's, 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 it's very important. I do, think, um, I do think this issue of anti-corruption is particularly important, and I know it's, it's kind of built, it's built into the work that you all do, but I think we as a country don't fully appreciate the, the, this issue of, of it. We, we've been the leader from in historically over the last 40 years from time to time on the issue of anti-corruption, and I, I think it's a vote-moving issue all over the world, and um, I think to the extent we can be at the front of the parade on anti-corruption work, the better, because uh, something like, I saw the World Economic Forum had a study that the issue of corruption is either number one, number two, or number three in something like 80 countries, yeah. and I bet that's a low, I bet it's higher than Well, that. and it's, the risk skyrockets for yeah. third parties, for private sector investment, and until you can get a handle on that, you, you're not going to have much of a yeah. sustainable economy. I, but, I, you know, in, in Cote d'Ivoire, for example, one of the ministers was talking to me about the need for more private sector investment, uh, the desire to have American companies come in and work on these projects. And one of the things he said is, we didn't really know how to bid these projects out until MCC showed up. We didn't understand what was needed, and we were talking different languages to potential partners. So. That and that in and of itself, that sort of transparency, that open procurement, that bidding process is itself a way to uh, fight corruption. And so we have a, we, I think we have a good track record and we're proud of it. Talk about, um, when you think about power and roads, and ports, uh, if I were to associate with those words, I think about China. So how does China come across the MCC's radar screen? Well, China, China, as everyone knows, is very active um, on infrastructure projects, uh, particularly in Africa. Yep. And MCC serves as a great example of an alternative system. We have, uh, it is country-led. So this is something that the host country is coming to us and, and asking for. We demand, as part of that process, stakeholder buy-in among the country. That's public, private sector, civil society. There has to be buy-in. So you're not going to have a sustainable project if, if it's not something that uh, folks in, the, in the, our partner countries want. We, are, we demand openness. We demand accountability. Um, a value for money on our contractors and our projects and we look to identify those projects that will have the greatest amount of measurable impact on the lives of our partner countries' citizens um, and look for that sustainability for, for their entire economy. And that, I think, that sort of self-determination and accountability and knowledge transfer to continue mm -hmm. um, on working on their own is Maybe perhaps comparable. Maybe as a contrast to other models. It is a it is a stark contrast to other models, other and models. I would uh, and I think it's a contrast that um, I think it's a very desirable. I, yeah, I would assume that I, I suspect when you go into many of the countries, I'm sh I'm sure that you are wel very welcomed in the Ivory Coast, for example. We were very welcomed. It was it was phenomenal to see, and, and I, you know, it's an honor to be to be representing MCC, but we're there as the United States of America. It's the U.S. government is involved yeah. in these countries. We have multiple partner agencies in, in our countries, and uh, they're very, very welcoming. Um, and like I say, it has a lot of cachet um, to you know, the agency. They, these the, countries want the United they States. They want the United States there. They want the United States there. I've got two other questions for you. One is on the role of the private sector. I know that the MCC has spent a lot of time and effort. I mean, a lot of the projects that you do either catalyze private sector investment or offer the opportunity to bring in the private sector as part of these projects. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. And I should say thank you. Dan is on our private sector advisory board, as I see yeah. Mima, hi, Mima. Yeah. Um, as, is as well. <laughs> good timing, Mima. Yeah, good timing. Uh, there's a seat right there for you. <laughs> we worked that out ahead of time. <laughs> we worked uh, that out ahead of time. Uh, but that is, a, that is a huge part of building a sustainable economy. If you don't have private capital flow and the, an environment that's attracting that, I, I don't know how you define it as sustainable. And so uh, we have MCCs leveraged, I think, $5.6 in private sector dollars into our projects over the course of our history. And that's, you know, we've been in 
37 countries with 29 compacts for about $14 billion worth of uh, development assistance, uh, benefiting about 200 million beneficiaries. And the private sector is a huge piece of that. So for example, in Malawi, um, ESCOM, the state utility, just entered a 20-year uh, power purchasing agreement with JCM Capital to develop a uh, commercial scale solar power uh, plant, which is a great thing because 95... There's a lot of sun. No, there's a lot of sun, and 95% yeah. of Malawi's power is hydro, and that has its own issues, and yeah. so trying you can to have a diversify drought. is great. Yeah. And then uh, in Cote d'Ivoire, we signed an agreement with Bechtel uh, and the uh, Ivorian government to, uh, for Bechtel to do a national master infrastructure plan. And so here we're going to have a plan that prioritizes Cote d'Ivoire's infrastructure projects. It's going to have the stamp of approval of the Ivorian government, of the United States government, and that hopefully will be shopped around to um, private sector partners, and we can, we can uh, get some investment. And the Ivorians are very excited about it. They want to come to the United States. They want to do a road show and uh, pitch the potential opportunities in Cote d'Ivoire. And one of the things that is very important to me is to elevate the knowledge level, particularly domestically, of what those opportunities are and what MCC does. Because when American companies bid on MCC projects, they tend to win those bids. But I'd like to see uh, I'd like to see more, more of it. More American companies competing. I'd like to see competing. more American companies competing. Okay, good. I'm going to we'll come back to, to that. Good. Okay, I've got one other question for you, which is um, the, the administration has made uh, women's economic empowerment an important part um, of its international work. Uh, we've done a number of things here to try and help um, the administration on that. Uh, I think every, I think there's a global understanding this is an important issue. I think the 2x initiative at OPIC I think has been a, a, an enormous success. I think uh, the the rollout of WGDP uh, is, is I think also something that's been very important as well. How does MCC fit into this conversation? Sure. Uh, well, first, the WGDP Women's Global Development and Prosperity the initiative was launched by President Trump. It's a whole of government approach to empowering women, uh, unlocking um, women's role in an economy, and spearheaded at the White House by uh, advisor of the President Ivanka Trump, who has been herself a, a real catalyst for change in this area and brought a great deal of focus and attention on our efforts. We're proud to be a part of it at MCC. And this is something that MCC has been uh, focused on for a long time. We have a gender in the economy indicator as part of our scorecard. We have a gender and social inclusion unit within our um, compact development operation because when you start to look at women's role in an economy and start to press on that issue, it's, it's everywhere across the spectrum and it's a giant opportunity um, to make a a sustainable economy. You're not going to have a sustainable economy if 50% of your population is not participating in it, is the bottom line. And so in all of our projects, we have that lens. And uh, a great example is, uh, is Cote d'Ivoire is a great example. We, we're entering into a, um, uh, in part of the compact is a secondary education program and a TVET training, a technical and vocational training program that is designed to empower women to participate in the, uh, in the economy. In Malawi, we had a program to bring female uh, employment into the energy sector, which didn't exist before. So ESCOM, the state utility, set up a gender inclusion unit within their entity to make that happen, and as part of that, they sponsored um, educational um, scholarships for young women. And so I was talking to a couple of young female engineers at one of the sites we visited, and they said they were so appreciative of MCC. They said, we wouldn't have our engineering degrees without the assistance that you all provided. 
And I said, well, what are you going to do? What are you going to do with it? What do you want to do? And he said, we want to come back to Malawi and we want to work mm -hmm. on making the second compact successful. And that, to me, is a nice uh, self-reinforcing circle and exactly the sort of thing that we are trying to accomplish. And, and by bringing attention to that issue and focusing on women's empowerment. So the, the White House and the Trump administration has done a great job yeah. in bringing attention to this. We're proud to be a part of it. It's something that MCC has as a priority and it's a personal priority of mine. Good. Okay, I, you've all been very patient. I, I wanna call in a couple people first. Um, uh, that, that I'm sorry, you're, you guys will forgive me for cold calling on you, but I, I do, Sarah Rose is I think one of the smartest people in town. I read her stuff on the MCC and I think has done some really great work at the Center for Global Development. So I want to give Sarah a chance to ask a question. I also want to give Tim Docking, who's been very involved with the, with the MCC and, and a variety of lives, and I want you to, you can introduce yourself. I'd like to give both of you a chance to kind of ask the first couple questions. So can you, my friend here, can give um, my friend Sarah a chance to, to ask the first question? I, I think she does some of the best work in town on MCC. Please, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Cairncross. It's a pleasure to meet you. It's a pleasure to hear from you. Uh, you. I can speak for a number of people in this room and in Washington more broadly that we're all very glad that you've joined uh, as, as the new CEO. So, so it, it's me great too. news all around. And uh, Dan, thanks so much for, for hosting uh, Mr. Cairncross and for, and for calling me to ask a question, too. So, so one of the things that I know that MCC um, thinks about every fall is the, the selection of new partner countries. And, and something that they've been thinking about for quite some time is, is how do you deal with uh, the question, sort of the existential question about whether or not MCC is going to be able to, and under what circumstances MCC might be able to enter into a third compact with a country. Um, so far, there hasn't been a third compact. There hasn't been probably the right kind of candidate country that's come up that would be a viable third, con uh, third compact kind of candidate. But I know that there's been some resistance um, in, in, among some stakeholders to even second compacts. MCC is, uh, has, um, has happily been able to push through that. But in a lot of ways, I think third compacts are really the future of MCC in a lot of ways, in addition to sort of this regional and concurrent focus that, that MCC has been granted. And so I guess I'd be interested in, in hearing your take yeah. on you know, what, what will be necessary, what will be important for MCC to be mm -hmm. able to um, sort of make that leap into hopefully third compact at some point. Soon. All right, before you answer, let me give Tim a chance to, to ask a, a question. I'll give you a chance also sure. to put your thoughts together. Tim, remind, share with the, our television audience who you are and, uh, and your various hats that you've worn with the MCC. Oh, geez. Uh, I don't know if I'll bore everybody with that, but I'm Tim Docking, uh, uh, Managing Director for the Refugee Investment Network, formerly with MCC, and sitting on the steering committee uh, for the private sector That's engagement yeah. uh, with the MCC. So thanks, uh, honored to talk to you today, and to, uh, Dan, thank you for holding this uh, uh, event. Um, I thought you did a very good job uh, covering the, the sort of the waterfront of all the things that, especially for the private sector aspect, uh, we're very much interested in uh, hearing more about. One of the things, though, you didn't talk about is um, the USDFC. If we would have been here about yeah. a year ago, yep. we would have okay. been talking about uh, the BUILD Act. Um, I know you spent some time, I think, over at OPIC uh, earlier this year, and I'm just curious on uh, any ideas, innovations that you think uh, might be appropriate Good. for MCC to take given uh, uh, DFC's uh, increased um, budget and authorities right. that they have. Excellent. Thanks. Okay. Do you want me to do? Yeah, those two. Okay, the two. I'll take Sarah's first. Yes, sir. Okay, great. Um, Sarah, that's a great question on third compacts. Uh, that is, there is conversation around that. Uh, to me, that falls into, is that something MCC could do? Yes, statutorily we could, we could do that. Is that something we should do? And I think that's a, um, I think that's a broader question. I think the mission of MCC isn't necessarily to always be in a country. We are, we are supposed to be helping a country on, its, on a journey to self-reliance and hopefully moving our, hopefully our engagement with our partner countries moves the needle in that direction. And so, as you know, for a second compact, there are a variety of things. There needs to be greater buy-in, um, more money put in by, the, by our partner countries, um, and, a, and a series of criteria that have to be met, yeah. more stringent on the scorecards, et cetera. And so that is a, I think that's a 
fundamental question that needs analysis and is going to need, uh, before we would consider even doing that, would take a lot of conversation with our stakeholders on the Hill and the administration among third party groups. And that's not, uh, I think the short way to say it is a, a third compact isn't something that I'm looking to engage um, in any sort of immediate capacity at all. Um, Tim, um, DFC, yes, uh, I think it's a, so part of what I, what I would love to see happen is, like I said, when we're in a country, we're there as MCC, but we're really there as the United States of America, and other agencies are there as well. So how can we maximize and leverage a unified effort between all agencies, and really OPIC and what will be the DFC and MCC fall sort of next to each other in that development arc. And the way I think of it is MCC comes in and creates a great enabling environment and hopefully that will increase the attractiveness for the sort of private sector deals that OPEC helps de-risk and fund um, with with private sector partners. And so what's important, I think, initially is that we have a good view into OPEC's pipe, deal pipeline in, uh, in Specific, countries. In countries where you have a complex or you have a threshold are, program. Or eligible countries, yeah. countries with threshold con or, or compacts, that they are aware of what we are doing in those countries, our timelines, and um, uh, and our goals and that we try to align those priorities. So as we move forward and as the DFC comes online and, and develops, I would expect that that, uh, and which is, we have good communication now, but I would expect that that would integrate even further and um, institutionalize yeah. in, in some way so that it's a collaborative, uh, a very collaborative effort. Let me, let me make two comments about, about that one, about Tim's question. Which is, thanks for, thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Tim. So I think there's sort of this magic moment of programmatic agnosticism of sort of six to nine months before you sign the piece of paper with the country, country government where, where either d private sector partners or the DFC that's sort of, I think, where the magic wind, the, the highest opportunity is there right before you sign a compact. Because I think once you sign a compact, you're, it's almost kind of put in cement. Your leverage decreases. Your leverage decreases yes. and you say, we're doing X and we're doing it in this place. Yes. And we're in, we're, at, we're, here, we're in year four and we've got 20 seconds, to, you know, the clock is ticking, that, that timer that you're describing in all these countries is, whether it's real or not, is there. So I think that I think there's a there's a moment there. So I think some of it's about timing. I think how how the DFC and MCC talk to each other and when in your cycle, yep. uh, I think is very important. The other thing to think about is I think there's good, could be some value in having secondments across the MCC and the DFC um, because I think the aid world and the development finance world have slightly different language. So AID not necessarily this is the case in the MCC, but maybe. Uh, the, in the grants world, a lot of the people who come to it think equity is th something that has to do with social justice, whereas development finance people, when they think about equity, has to do with shareholder ownership, yes. right? And so, so there's slightly different cultures. So I think there's some value in having, so I know it's a, you know, may, maybe a little bit uh, prosaic, but I think this issue of having, um, just getting the government agencies to kind of have some cross-fertilization of people. If you have inductions of new employees, to the extent they do rotations, to the extent they could do a rotation at the DFC, or to the extent that DFC is bringing in new hires, they ought to be doing a stint at aid, they ought to be doing a stint at the, no, at, no, at the MCC. I'm a, big, I'm a big believer in face-to-face -face interaction. And people knowing each other. People knowing each other, and uh, that's right, I did spend time in OPIC, that was very valuable to me. Um, they have a, a, a ton of innovative programs that they're working do on. Do important with stuff. Uh, credit financing creation. They have a, a co-lending platform with Liberty Insurance to de-risk uh, first loss insurance for investors and all of these things. And, and MCC's teams uh, have met with OPEX teams on this and they are, uh, there's a lot of crosstalk uh, and communication. So integrating further 
making sure that we, like I say, institutionalize it on some level and our, our people are constantly talking um, are what we've got to do. So let's take some other questions. I said Mima's got, I saw Mima's want to, want to ask a question, but I'd love to see my friend from, uh, from, uh, from various lives at Aiden State. And then how about, I'd love to hear from uh, this woman here, and I'd love to hear from Lori Rowley. So let's have those four, okay? All right, so let's start with Mima. Thank you, uh, Mima Nadelkovich. Welcome. Thank you. We've been waiting a long time. I was uh, with Tim on the- Remind folks who, in addition to being Mima, what oh, sorry. the hat you wear. <laughs> Um, I actually was uh, on the initial advisory council with, with, with Tim when I ran the, I uh, was president of the Initiative for Global Development. I've rolled out in the past year and back on the business side and developing projects in Africa. So I'm, I'm continuing to be on the advisory council. So I'd really like to come back to sort of private sector leveraging peace, in particular Africa, which is my neck of the woods. I, I think it's quite interesting and maybe the tie with USDFC. I mean, there's a classic case, for example, we've got, you know, U.S. solar power company in Burkina, you're doing, the MCC program is there, the talent to what we're doing is a classic continuation of that sort. But the, 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 the thing that, you know, that in terms of letting U.S. business know in the letter you received from us and discussions we've well, had. I was just going to say, the advisory council for MCC, they don't mess around. I got in and there was a letter on my desk that... Tim and Mina yes, and, and the, the Neil Minnie and others Neil Minnie. Looking for answers. put together. Yeah. But, you know, we were afraid at one point it was going to become a Magna Carta waiting in time for the CEO yeah. to come yeah, in. Yeah. <laughs> but in any case, I think the keep one of the, the big sort of recommendations that was getting out to the, the American business community, and it's also recognizing that it's not just marketing MCC in Washington, no. but really marketing MCA in the countries and the government agencies you're dealing with and leveraging off of there. So that's part of the message that's got to get out there. The other part, more as a question I've been thinking in the connection with USDFC, you know, we, you, MCC is the only granting mechanism, really, that we have, you know, in, in the USG. USDFC is basically a financing institution. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Europeans have gone forward with a blend you know, there's what they call something sustainable development fund that blends the grant with the, with the commercial financing to lower the cost of, of, of finance, of debt. It's something, I don't know if you're thinking about it, but I think there have been some early discussions. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that because that would be the big, big sort of requirement. Because right now... So how do you use MCC monies to blend with the DFC? Right, because MCC okay. has that capacity, DFC... Okay, so two questions. One is... How are you getting out to the American business? Yeah, and how do you blend? And how do we blend? Okay, sure. great. Okay, then my friend Bob, Bob Icourt over here, the, my, my colleague here will get you a microphone. Thank you very much. Bob Icourt, I'm currently at the Atlantic Council, but uh, was formerly with State and Aid, and worked very closely with MCC in many projects, in, including the uh, Power Africa. Oh, great. And in that context, I mean, I think the broader question, I think, is, is, is the whole of government approach especially in today's world where we face such challenges from China, et cetera, on economic development and growth. Um, so my, my, my question really um, gets to this, how do you see that all whole of government? Clearly it had a big impact in terms of relationship to the presidential initiative on Power Africa and, and it really, MCC put a lot of money mm -hmm. into it. And then, and then how, how is that how is that translating now into Indo-Pacific and Asia Edge and, and some of the initiatives? Uh, are, you, are you having that kind of interaction with the agencies okay. as you put together that initiative? So hold the government. Yeah. All right, let's, this woman here. Uh, thank you, Katie Wang with NTD TV. Uh, we know China has been uh, actively using that BRI uh, Belt and Road Initiative to project its power and the influence. So maybe can you give some comments about the situation in those countries? Are they still very interested in engaging with the United States and the MCC? And how about the situation there? Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so, so, okay, great. Thank you. And then my friend Lori Rowley back there. 
Thank you, Dan. I, I'm Lori Rowley with the Luger Center. I want to right. echo Sarah's welcome from Thank the community. You. We've been waiting for leadership, uh, uh, confirmed leadership at the MCC for a very long time. So we're very enthused to have someone in place and we're thrilled it's you. I wanted to ask you about your in, your vision of your role in government outside of your agency in the interagency mm. because um, as we in the development community continue to watch this administration's budget requests come in with 30% cuts and then read after Congress has, with the, the power of its purse, um, enacted final spending for state and AID, um, opportunities that the, age, the administration is seeking to rescind significant development mm. dollars, it to me begs the question, um, this hurts the MCC because it, in the long run, uh, you may be forced to only have third compacts with a small handful of countries if the development is not occurring to bring them to the process where they be can become threshold and st scorecard countries. So what is your view about what you'd like to do at the table with the interagency with regard to the whole of government budget in this process? Great. Thank you, Lori. Okay, so you got a number no, of let questions. Me do it. Let me see if I can do it. Let me see if I can, yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, I'll, I'll fail immediately. Um, okay, Mima, um, on U.S. or on private sector development, I, I couldn't agree more. We've got to get out outside of D.C., outside of Washington. In Malawi, there were Ellicott, uh, a Baltimore company, provided dredges. Caterpillar's equipment um, was all over the place. Um, harvesters from Wisconsin, GE helped um, design the power center and the, doing the training on the control center. And so, but that's all, <clears throat> I would be more than happy to engage with, um, with, with players or, or around the country and, and working with manufacturers and working with the uh, business round table or, or whatever the correct uh, group of people are to get out and, and make, the, make the case. In terms of blending uh, with the DFC, I think there are opportunities there. Again, what's important to me is that the model that MCC and the focus that MCC has had since its inception does not change, and that we stay laser focused on poverty reduction through economic growth, and that we stay the leading innovators and uh, executors of our large scale hard infrastructure projects. I mean, that is what, that's what made, has made us successful. That's what will continue to make MCC successful. And frankly, that's what draws um, the abundant talent that is at MCC. I mean, these are committed, highly educated, highly motivated, mission driven people working on that staff. And it's because of that focus. So, I think there are great opportunities, and we're going to work with with DSC and uh, and you know, Dave Bohegan and and the folks over there uh, to see where we are. But I want to keep that the the first you know, keep the the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing, and that's um, and that's what I want to do. Okay, um, power power Africa and our our inter engagement interagency. Uh, it I think that's. Uh, look, these are very, all of these environments are complex, very dynamic, and very challenging. And so where MCC, where we go, is not determined by necessarily by strategic needs. Um, but where, where we are, we ought to be engaged in a process of, of working to advance those interests. And so among the interagency, that's communication, that's making sure, like in Cote d'Ivoire and the, and the master infrastructure plan that's coming together, that's an important thing for MCC, and I think it's an important thing for the USG generally to know and have access to what are the needs, what are we trying to accomplish, how does this benefit what we are trying to achieve in West Africa generally. And so that's a, um, you know, the White House is a great coordinating body and the National Security Council does an enormous uh, and great work in convening that sort of collaboration and it's just got to continue. It's just got to continue. And in terms of 
around the world, we are, we're in Sri Lanka, we're in Nepal, we're in Mongolia, uh, we, uh, we're in the Solomon Islands now with the Threshold Program. We, uh, and all those are strategically important places. We're in Central America, strategically important yep. place. Um, and so we have the ability to, to help advance U.S. interests um, generally wherever we are, and it's just a process of relationship building and making sure that we're all working, uh, communicating clearly and working on the same page. Um, Belt and Road. Belt and Road. Um, as, I, as I was talking to Dan about earlier, MCC is a great, um, a great alternative and a great model to, that stands in contrast to Belt and Road, which is primarily drives debt. It does mm. not engage um, the civil society component of, um, of a country. It isn't an open bidding process. They're typically sole source state, yep. state owned enterprises. Mm. And it's really the antithesis of the sort of knowledge process and result that MCC and the United States is trying to model. Yeah, so, some would say it may be a, a neo, the Belt and Road may be a neo-colonial model. If I look at say what happened in Sri Lanka and they, uh, they, uh, everyone on, I, I think every U.S. Senator knows about the Hambantota port. Um, they know, uh, and I think that uh, when there was a 99 year lease, which is similar to the Hong Kong yep. uh, thing that just, it struck me that there's, so I think to the extent that the MCC is working for the, the to help change the, the dynamic of a country, I think there's, a, there, I do think it stands in contrast. Right, it's a, it, like I say, it's a model of accountability and self-determination, and we are there in partnership. And my impression from dealing with at least the governments of Malawi and Cote d'Ivoire very recently, is they, that's very clear. They understand it, they, they appreciate it, and they want that. So um, that's MCC's role, mm. and it may be a small agency, but it is a great face mm. uh, and example of, of what that model stands for and what it can accomplish. In, uh, okay, uh, where we stand. Everyone's been reading the newspaper. Yes, everyone's been reading the newspaper. Yeah. Uh, well, I think, I think that we're in a, this is, uh, this is obviously a broader conversation, and we're in a resource constrained environment. And so I think a, a wider discussion on uh, US development is a responsible conversation. I think where MCC sits in that is we are a great way to make the case for continued US engagement abroad in development, um, in development activity. And the reason for that is it works on multiple levels. We are great stewards of the American taxpayer dollars. We are achieving a concrete, measurable result for the U.S. taxpayer. We budget what we're going to do, we stick to that budget, and, uh, and we achieve a result. We hold countries accountable where, uh, where conditions aren't met or where they back up off the scorecard. We, we withdraw funds or we narrow the scope of the project. And that's not, that's not an idle threat. I mean, the, the accountability is baked into the model. I think 25% of the countries that we've worked with over the course of all our compacts have had some sort of deobligated funds or, or uh, the project's been narrowed in some respect. And so without that accountability, frankly, our leverage and our credibility goes down. And so that's very important to me. I know it's very important to the agency to continue that. I think it's, it's transparent and open in terms of the evaluation that's done on the, uh, the effects of the project. And it's a 20 year cycle. So it's the, the look back on our, uh, that the evaluations on our projects have will go longer than the agency's even been in existence to date. So you'll be able to look and gather information on this in the American taxpayer or any, anyone around the world can look and see what we've done. Um, 
and it's country-led. So yeah. you're really putting the onus on a partner country. It's a, it's a yeah. partnership. I kept saying this, I was thanked a few times um, traveling. Mm -hmm. People said, well, this is such a great gift. I said, it's not a gift. There's no, this, is a, this is a partnership. You do, you hold up your end of the bargain and we'll hold up okay. our end of the bargain. But Sean, you'll, you're gonna take the message back that there's a concern in the community about these rescissions. I, under, I understand very clearly what the concern is. And okay. like I say, from where I sit at MCC, I want to use our model and our example as a way to make the case for continued US engagement. Okay. All right, I think that's all we've got. Can you join me in thanking Sean Karen Thank Cross, you. please? Thank you. You're welcome.